Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, and I'm a fan of eliminating the fan. I know, I know, it's a touchy subject. A lot of you aren't fans of fans, but most of the time, they're a necessity, an integral part of a design. But what if we're talking about smaller enclosures, like cameras or imaging systems, and we need high-performance AI to make our system smarter? Look at here, I've got the world's smallest fan in this medical imaging application. Yeah, I don't think so. The best way to get rid of all that heat is not creating it in the first place. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. When you're doing an embedded vision application like surveillance systems, drones, or machine vision, an FPGA might be your best bet to ensure your power, performance, and form factor needs are well taken care of. In this episode of Chalk Talk, Avery Williams from Microchip and I dive in feet first into the world of embedded vision. We investigate machine learning in the cloud versus the edge, why FPGAs are ideal for vision and imaging applications, and why Microchip's Polar Fire FPGA might help you banish that fan once and for all. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about smart embedded vision solutions from Microchip Technology. Welcome, Avery. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Amelia. I'm very happy to be here today, especially talking about such an exciting topic like embedded vision. Yeah, embedded vision is a huge topic these days. But before we jump into all the details, tell me about that high level. What markets are you guys looking at? Okay, the specific markets we're focusing on is going to be machine vision, medical imaging, surveillance, and drones. So all of those sound pretty fun. Can we talk a little bit about the constraints and requirements that those applications bring? Yes, of course. Let's start with machine vision. Okay, so machine vision, you can use a camera or multiple cameras to analyze an object in real time. So think of industrial use, okay? And most of the time, these cameras are going to be small and they're going to be in small enclosures and you won't be able to have a heat sink or a large fan. So it has to be low power. Another factor that plays along with it is a machine learning capability. So you got to think like in the industrial setting of being able to count boxes that come through an assembly line and knowing how much of these boxes are in your inventory so you get an accurate count. Or maybe even a PCB inspected, like looking at a PCB board and knowing which component is supposed to be where and knowing which component is supposed to be in the correct orientation. So that's some of the constraints that go along with machine vision. Okay, so you mentioned small enclosures, very power limited. This sounds like it's going to be tricky already. You mentioned medical imaging. Now that has to be a very challenging one. Well, medical imaging is always going to be a tricky one. So I want you to think of endoscopes and portable ultrasounds. And these guys, they got to be accurate, okay? Because you're doing a lot of diagnosis and you want that to be as accurate as possible. So you don't want to make the wrong move or give somebody the wrong diagnosis because your camera system wasn't accurate enough. Another thing you got to think of is reliability. In the medical field, there's a lot of unwanted, unexpected problems that go on. You don't want one of those to be your camera system. So this thing has to be reliable and they got to be able to work when you need them to work. Another thing that comes along with that accuracy factor is it's going to be 4K video. So you're going to need to have a device that can drive and process that at a correct speed to the correct display port to wherever you want it to go, wherever the doctor can see and do his work and diagnose. And finally, another thing that I want to talk about is you got to think of some of the thermal constraints. Okay, these are going to be with human contact. So you don't want these things generating massive amounts of heat because they're touching somebody's skin and you don't want that to damage a person's skin. So these devices also have to be very low power. Yep. And I don't want any diagnosis done on me with low resolution, highly compressed JPEGs. <laughs> okay, so you mentioned surveillance systems. Now, wait, are there going to be any cameras in there? What's going on here? <laughs> no, there's no cameras in here, but surveillance systems, I, they should speak for themselves, the security aspect of it, and you want it to be able to protect against network attacks. So security is definitely going to be a big factor. And right now, these cameras are deployed at 1080p, 30 frames per second. So they got to be compressed at a certain rate. And most of these camera surveillance systems have fixed 
power budget that you also have to account for. And nowadays, camera systems are moving towards 4K. That's quadrupling the data. So that means that this data needs to be compressed in order to preserve the bandwidth for existing wired infrastructure or power infrastructure. And again, cameras are getting smarter. Let me talk about that machine learning aspect of it all. The camera is going to be able to count cars on a freeway to know how many cars are on a given freeway. So a given freeway can get overcrowded and it can relay that message to a driver so they know to take a different exit or a different route. No, I definitely don't like sitting in traffic. And I'm starting to notice some themes here. Low power, small form factor, high performance. But let's move on to one of my favorites. You mentioned drones. So drones have just taken the world by storm in the last five years. These things are everywhere in consumer, industrial, military. But some requirements for these drones are that let's think about it. You don't want your drone to go up for 45 minutes and then have to come down and you got to charge it again or you got to replace the battery. You want this thing to be flying for a good amount of time. You're going to want it to be low power so you can address these different battery issues and so you can keep it in the air for as long as you want. Another thing, again, there's that word machine learning. It's going to be able to do object detection. One of my favorite stories is I live in California, and unfortunately, we do have a lot of fires. Well, the firefighters sometimes use these drones to fly ahead, and it can detect where the fire is, and they can adjust and adapt accordingly with this information. So it's helping them out in real time. Also, military drones are another story because they need more range. It's a security factor, so they need secure communications, and they got to be able to upgrade in flight and in real time. I can see you wouldn't want just anyone hacking into your military drone in particular, so I'm on the edge of my seat. Let's talk about machine learning at the edge. So machine learning, let's kind of highlight what I was talking about before with these different given applications. You kind of need machine learning for object detection with the drone to see the fire. You're going to need machine learning to count these different cars on the highway. You're going to need machine learning to maybe even advance diagnostics when it comes to the medical imaging side. So for all those things, you're going to need machine learning to act in real time. Because let me give you an example of machine learning in a car system. So these cars are all getting smarter, by the way. Let me just say that, that each car is being able to know what's around it and detect these different objects with machine learning. So let's say you're driving along and you're not paying attention in a car and there's a person in front of you. You want this thing to be able to act in real time to detect the person in front of you so it can hit the brakes because you don't want a person's safety being jeopardized by the fact that this takes too long to process the given information. That's one of the reasons why machine learning has to be at the edge. Yeah, I wouldn't want my car sending images up to the cloud and then waiting for an answer to come back and why, yes, that was a pedestrian. Now, AI has been a really big hot topic just about everywhere these days. And you've been talking about machine learning, which is a flavor of AI. So tell me more about that. Okay, so machine learning, you got to think about it as generating a model. And you're generating a model to do a certain task. And in order to generate an effective model, you need to send it a lot of data, a lot of information. For example, let's say you're training a model to recognize a cat. If you just send the model a picture of a black cat and it sees a brown one, it's not going to be able to detect it because it's a different version of a cat. So you want to send this model a bunch of different versions of a bunch of different cats so it can get smarter and smarter. So the amount of training you do determines how accurate your trained model is going to be. And once you do get that trained model, you're going to go into your next step, which is the inference stage. Okay, yes, I know that machine learning is broken down into training and inference, but explain more about that. We harped on the training side of it in the first stage, where that's going to take place over hours, days, weeks, and you're going to be collecting this massive amount of data, and you're going to be using this data to form a trained model. Once you have that trained model, you're going to get into the inference stage. And with the inference stage, you're going to get this data from a camera sensor or a camera, and it's going to pick up the picture of that cat that I mentioned. It's going to be able to spot it and make an instantaneous decision to determine that it is a cat. Now, the inference part is what is done at the edge, right? Correct. But I understand that it takes a lot of computing power. So why is it usually done in data centers? And why do we need to make that happen at the edge? So I'm going to break down the compute framework 
really quickly. So on the left, we have our cloud and data center. In the middle, we have our gateways and transport. And on the right, we have our devices, sensors, and actuators. So I want you to think of the data center and cloud as your brain. I want you to think of the gateways and the transport as your nervous system. And I want you to think of the devices, sensors, actuators as your fingertips. Okay. So if you want your fingertips to do something, you tell your brain tells your nervous system and it passes along to the fingertips. Well, what if it's taking too long to get from your brain to your fingertips. What if there was a way that we can draw an edge around your nervous system and your fingertips and make it so that edge gets smarter and it's able to act without your brain in general. So now it's going to be faster. You're going to have less latency. It's going to be more deterministic. And yes, that space is constrained and that power that goes along with that, that action is constrained, but you're still going to get it in a faster and more real-time applicable application, which is what we want to touch on. Yeah, I can see how it might be slow if my brain was, say, in a data center in Cleveland. Okay, so let's dive in now and talk more specifically about microchip solutions. For microchip solutions, from the sensor interface to the display out, we have all the IP necessary. We have the flexibility to put all these different types of visual cameras all on one chip and all in one small form factor solution. So from DDR to image processing to deep learning to compression, all things you do need for embedded solution, we have it all in one chip. So it's really going to save you the unnecessary hassle of going out and getting these different IPs from different sources because it's all together in one place. That's very cool. Now, talk to me about the networking aspect of all of this. Okay, so as you can tell, there's an abundance of different network interface IPs from Coaxial Express all the way down to USB 3 Vision, Generation 2. And these different network interfaces require different things, different speeds, different costs, complexity, max length, cable, and data integrity, a whole bunch of stuff. So what I wanted to show you is that Embedded vision solutions, there's different type of aspects for the different type of applications that many people are trying to do. It's not just focused on one area. It's a whole bunch of areas that people can touch. And there's different network IPs that people can get that interact with all of these different areas. Now, we're here talking about FPGA-based solutions. And that's one of the reasons I'm going to be able to handle all of these different network protocols and speeds and so forth, right? Of course. So the reason why FPGAs excel in smart embedded vision is high data throughput, parallel processing, and high speed I.O. This means that they're going to have the ability to do that pre-processing for image recognition. They're going to be able to support the highest dynamic range cameras and highest resolution sensors and to harp on the parallel processing application for machine learning. Many of these machine learning applications do need that parallel processing. They're handling so much data at once. In order to process this data, you do need that parallel processing to be doing multiple things at once. Got it. Yeah. Now, it seems like FPGA flexibility is great for what you're describing, where every system needs to be a little bit different. Exactly. Now, talk to me about your Polar Fire FPGAs. Our Polar Fire was released in 2017, and since its release, it has won five awards. It targets the lowest power proven security, and exceptional reliability, while still maintaining high-speed IOs and high-speed transceivers that fit in perfectly with Smart Embedded Vision. Yep, those are exactly the attributes we've been talking about for our embedded edge applications. So FPGAs are known for using quite a bit of power. Is PolarFire low enough power for these embedded edge applications? I have this graphic for you, and the graphic shows that the Polar Fire is going to be below 5 watts, and most other competitor FPGA is going to be above 5 watts. Why is that important? Because 5 watts is the edge of the fan zone. We're talking about eliminating a fan just by having a low enough power, which would tarse back on the cost-optimized solution that is the Polar Fire. I'm definitely a fan of eliminating fans. So let's talk about Polar Fire and the embedded vision specifically. Let me harp back on the applications that we mentioned and some of the requirements that Polar Fire addresses. Starting with drones, okay? I, like I said before, you don't want your drone going up for 45 minutes and then having to come down because it doesn't have a long enough battery life. Since Polar Fire has 
such a low amount of total power, it can stay in the air for a substantial amount of time. Next, let's harp on the machine vision aspect of it. These small cameras and small enclosures where you don't have the room to have these fans or these big heat sinks. So like I just mentioned in the, in the previous slide, well, the polar fire being under five watts sort of eliminates these fans and they sort of eliminate these big heat sinks. So you don't have to worry about that when you're planning your machine vision application. And again, with medical imaging, you're going to need reliability. Well, polar fire has proven reliability and it also has SEU immune zero flash configuration. So reliability is definitely a focal point for polar fires. Now, I don't have to worry about some neutron flying in from outer space and messing up my medical imagers, right? So let's say I want to get started using Polar Fire in my next embedded vision application. Do you have any kits that might help me get going? So we do have this SEV video platform board. So it has two Sony camera interfaces. It's also going to have the correct interfaces. Like It's going to have MIPI, HDMI, SDI, these different interfaces that can be used to prototype in different applications like medical imaging, like drones, like surveillance systems, like machine vision. And I see you have a demo? Yes, yes, we, we do have a demonstration. And what you're going to be able to do with that demo is that the MIPI is going to receive that data and it's going to be stored in the DDR and that's going to be passed to whatever HDMI output that you want. And with the demo, you're going to be able to support image enhancements such as contrast, brightness, color balance, and alpha blending. Okay, cool. I'm anxious to try that out. Now I'm going to click that link and go to a mauser.com site for more information and see what resources you have for me to help me get started on my embedded vision development. Well, Avery, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much for having me. I've had a great time. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about smart embedded vision solutions from Microchip Technology. For Chalk Talk, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talk section of EE Journal. You can't miss it, it's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal.com.